And Jesus was never like, you have to go to church Sunday mornings at this time. You have to do this at that time. No. There, it's about- <laughs> there is much judgment for the no show. There is little judgment for the late service attendee. <laughs> Hello and welcome back to the Anything But Quiet Time podcast. We are Rochelle and the nation of France right here uh, with Rochelle and her. And if you're not watching- From Charles Schultz. It is a Peanuts, but it's red, white, and blue, not the American way. And he's playing- Badminton? Tennis. Tennis? Tennis, yeah. I don't even care about tennis. But it was Snoopy okay. and it, it was on a Walmart rack for $5. If you want to see Thanks for this pointing it out. sweatshirt, then text <laughs> the word quiet to the number 893-893 yeah. and you'll get the video link as well. We're on YouTube, not just Spotify and Apple. Usually when people, they, they do a thing for YouTube, they're like, what can I wear that I can dress up? I could look nice. Rochelle wears her $5 Snoopy clearance rack. It's great. It's great. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. You're welcome. Because I don't right. like the band around the bottom because it's super constricting. I just cut it off. Okay. So it's really thoughtful. You That's know, great. a That's lot of great. time put into it. You this. didn't have to share all that you did. You're I, the one who started it. I, and you'll finish it with it, more embarrassing see, details. This is good. This is part of the anything but quiet time. <laughs> uh, okay. Misconceptions of Christianity. Ooh, do tell. And there's a lot of them. Yes, there are. You think about misconceptions. This is what is keeping people from saying yes. People who are thoughtful, people who really are searching, yeah, perhaps, yeah. Or these are the mis these are the misperceptions that people will utilize because they just want to stay stagnant. Choice is a belief. Or, or excuse me, belief is a choice. Like they, right? If you want to keep doing what you're doing, you can use probably some of what you're about to share to just say, right. well, that's why. You know, so yesterday, this is kind of interesting. I looked up, where did Buffalo Wild Wings, like <laughs> Buffalo Wings, where did this come from? Oh, where did, oh, okay, okay, yeah. When did that start? And there are so many origin stories for stuff like these, you know, these types of things that get started. Yeah. I made the chocolate chip cookie. No, I did, you know. And right. Buffalo Wild Wings, I think, is nothing... It's the same kind of a thing. And I remember it was in the 80s that my family was introduced. Hey, have you gone to this place? Okay, so you're talking they about- They serve these wings. The specifically Buffalo Wild Wings, just the restaurant. Just Buffalo Wings. Oh, just Buffalo Wings. Called. Okay, okay, right. I'm right, sorry, yeah. I keep putting wild in that, there. That's the, the restaurant. Right, I'm yeah, sorry. Okay, all right. <laughs> but Buffalo Wings, there was this origin story where it's like one day after work, this lady, she, they, she had a restaurant and her son and their friend's were just hanging out and she had some, I mean, you think about all the pieces of the chicken that people really want. Nobody's going like, give me the tiniest part. Uh So they had all these wings and stuff left over and she just cooked them up one day and put hot sauce on them and there you go. Wow. That's what one origin story. Yeah. But if you think about it, there are so many origin stories. And if I went out and I shared that story as if it was fact and and it might be, but I'm just saying, I just shared it as fact when I didn't also research that there were 200,000 other <laughs> <laughs> right. origin yeah. stories, I'd be like, nope, nope, y'all are wrong because it started here at this restaurant. This mom made it for her kids. I know it. I know it. That's what it is. Uh-huh. And so these are the things that are misconceptions of our faith that a lot of people say, oh, because it's true. That's fact. And we don't necessarily do a great job. Maybe we've even heard these old wives tale rumor type things about our faith where we're like, oh, that's a really good question. That's it. I don't know if we have a leg to stand on with that particular Mm -hmm. perspective, conception. And it's important that we research these types of things for ourselves so that we are able to have a leg to stand on with people so that when they really do ask great questions or even share something as fact, you're able to go, Actually, I had to look that up. Yeah, you mentioned a, a, a couple of these here before we started, and I think there's some easier to answer than others. Yes. Sometimes it's like, it, now if they're really being genuine, it's you, you'd be patient, but sometimes it's like, that's really dumb. Yeah, that's- uh, And then some are like, no, that's a hard question and I wrestle with it too. Yeah. So. It, yeah, so the first misconception that is tackled in this book, by the way, it's evidence. I'm, I'm just giving you the first word of the book. You'll find it easily if you Google Josh McDowell evidence. They've recently updated in this in this millennia. But um, Christianity doesn't need evidence because faith is blind. 
See, that's a lot of Christians that will say yes. that uh, faith is blind. I think yeah. I've actually said that to people in my younger years when I wasn't able to tackle their questions with enough information. Mm-hmm. And I said, at some point, you have to stop overthinking it and start believing. Mm -hmm. And that was just, especially where my friend was, that was like that, what you just said scares me to death. And on some level, I think they're right. It should, you should get answers. You should try as best as you can to find the information you need that helps you go, this is not a scam. Yeah. Yeah. No, and and that's the thing is there is uh, so much evidence for Christianity. Yes. Um, But if I just default and just say, well, it's just, you just got to have faith. There's still truth in it because sure. the way that sure. I look at this, when I've had my own doubts and whatnot, when I look at, I look at it like a courtroom and we are all observing the evidence, me and the other juror, jurors. And then we go back to the deliberation room mm-hmm. and we there, no matter the situation, there's often that somebody will go, well, I don't think he did it. Well, I do think he did it. Sure. And you saw the same evidence. Yeah. And sometimes it's so overwhelming, but there's still one holdout. Sometimes Mm -hmm. the overwhelming evidence still won't convince a person that refuses it because they have something in their head. Right. At the same time, we have to recognize that if I'm in the jury in this situation, um, I wasn't there. And Mm -hmm. I can't 100% validate with 100% certainty that it happened. But the evidence goes to show that right. overwhelmingly. Yes. Now, so that's where that leap of faith is. Right. But belief is a choice. And I see the evidence and I go, I choose to believe that. That's I, the best explanation. That's really good. And I, as a child, when I said yes to Jesus, I really do think of that as more of a spiritual and Holy Spirit encounter. Mm-hmm. When you say yes to the Lord and maybe the facts and stuff that you need to quote, build a case for Christ, follows. Mm -hmm. Hopefully I invest more in the relationship. When I fell in love with my husband, like first off, I will admit it was puppy love. You're all in Uh and you think the things that will later you'll find maybe annoying is adorable. Right. Right? Right. Yeah. Because you've got more information now. Uh, I now know my husband even more than I've ever known him. Sure. I have more facts to back why I love him, why I married him. Yeah. yeah. And I think that that we can observe like as that young person who was trying to share my faith, this is something I know regardless of not having enough information to help you make your own conclusions. Yeah. Um, I took that step of faith because I had an experience that led me to, to know this is true. Yeah. But now even the more that I observe, like the more I'm with my husband, the more I observe Christ, the more I read about it, the more I know, the more I go, oh, for realsies, this is great. Yeah, And right. it just gets me even more fired up. Right. And that's the only thing is my experience won't convince somebody else. Now, I mean, maybe, maybe it will. If, I, if I've had a radical 180 and I know them well for a long span, right. they'll see like, that's that dude's different now. Uh, but generally, if I just meet somebody on the street or comment on the internet, Will he change my life? All right, good for you. Yeah. I mean, my experience isn't going to be evidence for somebody else, but it is important because it's evidence for me. Well, and the word evidence is really important in scripture, isn't it? Talking about faith is the evidence of things unseen. Sure. And if it's sure. evidence, then that means it's something that you can point to. And that's where I look at the end of the book of John. It's not the very last chapter. It's like chapter 20 or something. And John writes, there were many more, miracles uh-huh. or things or whatever he says. And he's like, we have written these things down so that you will believe. Yeah, He's presenting evidence yes. to say this really happened. You weren't there. You weren't there. You didn't see it. But you can trust me because first of all, it's not just me, it's a lot of witnesses. Yeah. And um, I'll just get into this real quick. This won't take long, but because it's just so fascinating. He says, let's time him, shall so, we? So uh, four score and seven <laughs> years ago. No, the, just the, the idea of a legend a legend really can't get going until like one or two generations after the supposed time it happened. Because it can't get, you can't make a legend about right now because we're all here. We know whether it happened or not. Mm -hmm. And the fact that these testimonials, the evidence that John's pointing to and Mark and Luke, and uh, that's circulating around people who were alive when Jesus was alive. 
It can't get going until, unless you say, well, the Bible is actually written in the 1600s. Well, then you can make a legend, right? right? You can't do it in the time that people actually go, oh, I was there, bro, it didn't happen. Right. And so the fact that we have these actual people saying it happened- It did happen. And that it's still circulated is, well, more evidence. Right. And they were so convincing, they didn't have anything written down to believe because they were being told firsthand. <laughs> right, yeah. And these guys- this was this, these are smaller towns, you know? Right, right. We currently, Carter and I live in a pretty large hub. We live in the Houston hub. It's a pretty big area. There's a lot of people here. But these little towns, people knew people. People knew people. That's right. And they knew that that guy is not the same guy mm-hmm. anymore. Mm-hmm. That guy's changed. Right, right. The Apostle Paul was also just this huge credit to the Christian way because it's like. <laughs> That guy literally, I saw him yesterday. Yeah. Going into homes, grabbing people and throwing them into jail. And now he's on their team. What? What? Well, and and people being willing to die. Yeah. For a for yes. a lie or a legend makes no sense. A lot of people though would would argue about uh martyrs of other faiths. Though. And yeah, that uh, that certainly comes up. Yeah. But um But on the scale of this. And and I would also ask you to always, always, especially after, I, I was always fascinated by other faiths and wanting to be able to have an open conversation with people because clearly so many good people, people who live lives with a moral compass, but are not living a Christian life, I would love to have a conversation, but I don't know necessarily enough about their faith to hold a good enough conversation per sure, se, sure. to be able to to kind of say, well, this is why this differs. I think the older I get though, it's not even about having enough information about what it is they believe. Maybe even just encouraging time spent and saying, would you share with me? Sure. What you believe? Yeah. And now I've heard from somebody where they stand and now I'm actually maybe even able to to speak encouragement like Paul did in Athens and say, what you shared just now, that is absolute truth. That is beautiful what you just shared. Um, what you shared before differs with my faith and here's why. You yeah. Know? Well, and, and it's interesting, I heard, just heard somebody talk about this. He didn't say, all of those are valid. No. He didn't, he didn't say that. Right. He said, this is the one you're going to want to focus on. You put on. up the yeah. unknown God. Uh-huh. And this is the one. Yeah. But he did affirm the fact that there was an attempt made, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So let's point to that. There's an attempt here at truth. And I, I just want you to know that I, I'm a seeker of truth like you are. And I know that if you're constantly seeking the truth, God, it's promises that he, you will find him. And, you know, you can have this conversation with this other person without having to know everything. But in Nabil's story, just having a little bit more knowledge about Islam and how Jesus is going to fulfill everything that he has ever hoped for the relationship that he had had prior to his Christian conversion, like, he was so undone by, and I think I shared this in the last podcast, but when he shared that piece of if you, if you, uh, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, mm-hmm. this is part of that incredible sermon that Jesus gives us in one of the Beatitudes. Um, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness will be, they shall see God. And he's like, I do that. I do that. Oh my gosh. You mean this is, so there's grace for me because clearly he was working off of a schematic um, that involved if he did enough good, he might be allowed to go into heaven. Yeah. And generally, unless you're you're killing people or something like that, you're doing way more good than you're doing bad, uh-huh. right? And Allah is going to allow you passage into heaven. But it is based on not what he can do for you, certainly because he's God and he's way better and loftier and higher than anything you could ever be. And even their great prophet Muhammad, you know, it's like he was still a man, but, you know, here's this revered person in their culture. And uh, it was just fascinating for him to see and understand truly the scriptures that he was reading. And he was so completely undone with the grace of a God who would die for him and because it's it's preposterous yeah. in the faith that he grew up in to believe such a thing. God would not die for me. I am immortal. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't deserve that. That's ridiculous. 
Yeah. This is a lovely fairy tale, if you will, but it's lies. Jesus was a really great guy. He was the son of God. He certainly was not God. And he went on to do great things. He was not crucified. There are definite differences in our faith, which leads us to another misconception. Well, hold on there. Oh. I definitely want to get to that second misconception, but uh, there's so much there is so good. We specifically with Islam, we, we I showed you that clip of uh, William Lane Craig yeah. uh, on say he's a great, you know, theologian and, and debater and doctorate and all that stuff. And uh, somebody asked him, aren't uh, people call it the Abrahamic religions? Aren't uh, yeah. Allah and God the same God? Don't we worship the same God? And he broke it down to, but who is, what are the characteristics? Yeah. Because you can get caught in, well, technically at this time and all, he said, but, and he, he pointed to, the God of the Bible is loving. The God of the Bible loved you before you were his. Yes. He loved you while you were still an enemy. Mm -hmm. The God of Islam does not do that. It's a different situation. Now the thing about, and one and is- He's merciful, but grace is not, I'm not seeing no, grace involved there. You have to earn it, right? Yeah. And that's where if anybody, if any religion, which it's most of them, if not all of them, they're not, they can't tell you if they're sure that they're going to heaven. And I, I'll just tell you, I'll just let you, the whole homework assignment, Romans 4, mm -hmm. like 4, 16, is incredible. It, 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 I guess I'll ask people all the time, do you know if you're going to heaven for sure? Mm -hmm. And they go, well, you know, I have pretty good, you know, idea that I'm probably on the right track, but they don't know. Yeah. They can't guarantee it. And it says, depending on the translation, it says the guaranteed promise of eternal life, not for those who are good enough or obey the law, but through the promise of Jesus. So we can guarantee that we're going to heaven right now if you put your faith in him. That's Romans four. Again, it's a great chapter. Uh, but I think the thing about Nabil is- is um, I, think I can't wait to meet us, that guy in heaven. I know, right? My family's like, yes, you can. We need you a little longer here. Right. <laughs> He's with Jesus now, but- I, I think it's hard in our culture because we don't, the culture isn't inviting to truth seekers. It's inviting to people who just want to be happy and content. And we're happy to just be, I believe what you, what I believe and you believe what you believe and we can still be friends. And it's probably about the same thing that we believe anyway. We're all going to the same God. It's just, uh, somebody said it the other day. In fact, I think a big figure said it the other day uh, that all the religions of the world are just different languages for the same God. Not at all. No, it's not. No, it's not. And, and what's hard in where you and I live, and, and if wherever you're listening, it's true about this time that we live in, is we just don't want to offend. We don't want to ruffle feathers. We don't want to seek truth. We want to be content and just be happy. When my child is doing something that my child should not be doing, there's that part of you that wants, resists having to be the bad guy, if you will. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Because you love them. Of course, yeah. And you understand why they did what they did. Uh, maybe they wanted the extra cookie and for whatever reason that day or the day before they didn't get the extra, they didn't get the right cookie. I don't know, whatever the thing is. But it's something you clearly laid the law down, if you will. And you're like, this is the rule. And they went and did the thing anyway. And maybe they even had a justified reason for doing it in their mind. They justified, well, I didn't get, a, two days ago, there was zero cookie. <laughs> we can always justify, can't we? Yeah. I want another, I, did, I should get the cookie today because I didn't get it two days ago. There you go. Bada bing, bada boom. No, that's not the rule. And there's that part of you that wants to withhold the punishment because you're like, kind of actually logically sort of can be justified. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. But that's twisted logic. You've twisted it to fit something that you need it to fit into. Yeah. We have seen a mass, and this is another misconception, like um, Christianity cannot be true because the church has committed injustices. And I think you compare that along with the hypocrisy of Christians undermines the reasonability of the Christian faith. Yeah, those, that's a big those couple are of two. misconceptions for people two. that yeah. aren't in the church, right? Those are huge reasons as to why. And I saw this documentary that, a, a few days ago, this horrible situation where uh, there was a church on every corner and to this group of people, and they were raised in the 80s and uh, early 90s. And it, hey, look, this is what you just do. You go to church. If you don't go to church, nah. 
you got to go to church. You're going to go to church. We're not talking about relationship with Jesus. Yeah, it was really, true religion, wasn't you it? You yeah. truly, if you are not going to church, I'm sorry, it's just what you do. That, and then that, honestly, that small town vibe has been prevalent throughout centuries of churchdom. You just go every Sunday, we go to mass, we do this, we, this is how we do it. It's just what you do. And Jesus was never like, you have to go to church Sunday mornings at this time. You have to do this at that time. No. There, it's about- <laughs> there is much judgment for the no-show. There is little judgment for the late service attendee. <laughs> and what's really, really sad about the documentary I was watching is that there was some church leadership. There were Sunday school teachers and they were hiding. This guy was hiding a secret. And unfortunately, he was not a good guy. He was doing criminal acts. But it was a mask of righteousness. Yeah. that he was using. Yeah. And I understand that that is highly offensive to the mind. And it, why would I want to? And if that had been my experience, like my friend, this little girl had been murdered, mm. had been raped by her f- foster dad, adopted dad, who was a Sunday school teacher. And the other kids that went to church, because that's what you're supposed to do, when they are now adults talking to the camera about the atrocities, they were rolling their eyes about, well, the church helped them cover because there was like this session after she admitted, my dad is doing stuff to me. The pastor meets with her. And the next time the mom in the situation sees the girl, the pastor says, what do you have to say? I lied. I made it up. Huge injustice. Yeah. It would be enough for anybody to say, I don't want to have anything to do with this organized religion. Mm -hmm. The thing is, is that I would first congratulate them for calling it exactly what it is, an organized religion. But that is not Christianity. True Christianity is about your relationship with Jesus Christ. The true church is the body of Christ. And unfortunately, there is ugly in many churches, but they have zero, to, they are antichrist. They have nothing to do with Jesus. And, and that's the beauty of scripture is that we don't know why God has allowed what he's allowed, but we were never promised anything in that realm. What we were promised actually was, I think about the parable that Jesus tells about the wheat and the weeds and the wheat is is being grown mm-hmm. and the the a field owner's enemy comes and plants weeds all in there yeah and the field owner when the when the servants say hey you know we want to pick these weeds no cuz you'll harm the wheat only when it's harvest time will both be pulled and the weeds will go under the fire and the wheat will go to harvest I, and yeah. that, and that is in False prophets, right? Mm -hmm. Wolves in sheep's clothing. Yes. Bad things in this life. People that blend in with Christianity. Right. But aren't truly living it. Living a secret life or whatever it might be, but that will get taken care of at the end of time. So this is is our encouragement. Uh, When we hear those kinds of stories, it's enough to make you want to, the righteous anger, indignation, what have you. Mm-hmm. You you want to rise up and do something that probably is crossing the line of what the Holy Spirit would actually have you do. You want to you want to punch some people in the face, right? You hear stuff like that, uh, atrocities against children. Well, how much more does our God, who it tells us in scripture is very capable of wrath, yep. but whose wrath is satisfied through the cross of Christ, that's why we have not been eliminated yet because we have a place in Christ and that all shouldn't perish. I mean, we have a chance now, even to these people who have been given this vilified moniker of monster, they even have an opportunity. Yep. Because in Jesus Christ, we are a new creation. Old things have passed away and new things are are, are presently capable now in our hearts because the kingdom of heaven is now and it's in you because you said yes to Jesus. And it's it's a lot to unpack. It does require a heart that's seeking. And so here I was watching this documentary and seeing the people who were incredulous about what the church had been covering up, that particular church, not our Jesus body church, not the people who have truly made it. Their life's journeys work to just invite the Holy Spirit to show them what to do, right? 
Those are the type of churches you want, a Jesus honoring, Christ seeking church yeah. that relies on scripture, even as the guts to get up. I screwed up last week. I said this and you know what? I found more information. Church, let's talk about, this is what this is. You know what I mean? Yep. Somebody has the guts to seek God and honor our Lord by, by being honest. Um, we, ha- we owe it to our fellow man who have experienced deep hurt. So those deep hurts have collectively, I think, taken us to this place of, we wanna be comfortable. We want them to be okay. And that does not feel like the Jesus that everybody was preaching about. Uh Uh-huh, yeah. So this feels like more like Jesus. Yeah, yeah, You know, this feels more, this is more where I wanna be. And so they've now dismissed what, maybe we've been teaching out of the Bible because that church did us a, yeah. a disservice. The, the reaction can go one of two ways, right? Either you ignore that stuff and you don't believe them. When, I think I shared a, week, a couple of weeks ago, church hurt is real. Yeah, it's real. I saw I saw people oust my original youth minister just because he didn't uh, like camping. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's more than that. But, <laughs> but it was it was essentially like, we don't, you're not doing it the way we wanted to and we were, we were gonna ask you to leave, you know? And it's like, that's not really, I feel like the most important thing. <laughs> um, and yeah. so it's real. And I have to be willing to sit down and hear these stories and believe people mm-hmm. when they say they've been hurt by the church. Now, at the same time, I also recognize that there's a reality mm-hmm. that some people never believed in the first place uh, or maybe followed, but really just want to sin is what it mm-hmm. comes down to. And that's why they're leaving the church. And so I, I can't go to one extreme and go, you're not accurate at all. The church is perfect. And I also can't go to the extreme of going, of going, wow, you must have, wow, I guess everything that you're living now is, it seems more loving. So I guess that must be true and good when it's against scripture because it, it has to be so balanced of, of empathy or sympathy at the very least mm-hmm. and yet truth. Yeah. And it's it's a hard line to follow pending on the situation that you're put in, pending on the critic that might be in your life and the reason that they left the church that so they're not a believer. Um, and so, I mean, and sincerely, Godspeed in that. If you have a yeah. person in your life that has left or whatever, uh, because it's it's difficult. Yeah. And you don't want to give in to it, but you don't want to be oblivious to it either. I mean, there's a third grouping of people there. You talked about the the ones who just just want it to go away or cover it up and it's fine. There's also the people that maybe you said never have believed it. Yeah, I'm talking about the people that are kind of, um, is that kind of blended Christians and then I'll call them deconstructionists, right? Okay. Deconstructionists, I think there's people that have legitimately been hurt by the church. Mm-hmm. Um, and they have, at the, you know, that's a range anyway, right? And whether they actually believed it or... And that's a question. Maybe they right. never believed... Maybe they've left the American evangelical church and they're still faithful believers, but doing home church. Like that's a yeah. possibility of deconstruction. I think it's very few, uh, but I think that's a possibility of, of that term. And then you have a lot of people that have grown up in church and been hurt by it in some way and left. And some of these people won't comment much on their belief. Some people will say, I was a genuine Christian. Yeah. And often, not everybody, but often what comes out of their mouth next is just all the things that they did. I was at Sunday school every week. I went to summer camp. I went, dude, I don't care about the things you did. That in terms of genuine belief, it's not about the things that we did. It's about, did you truly have a relationship with Jesus? Now, when yeah. some I've heard pressed and they still say, no, I did. I believed and I blah, blah, blah. And now I'm not a Christian. And that's where, you know, that's where you get into evidence. I was going to say, talking about, that's right? where your faith needs to meet up with evidence. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and if you've experienced, well, and and there's so many kids who absolutely, they, they got put in a really bad situation because they believed for something, but because they were given misinformation. Sure. That's true too. And That's well, true. but I, I was told that if I just believe or if I just pray enough for it, or if I just, you uh-huh, know, uh-huh. and w- you may be listening and going, well, actually, doesn't the Bible say that? Because Jesus told his disciples, surely I say to you, if you have faith as, as small, even as a mustard seed, that you tell this mountain to move and won't it move? And so if you take that passage out of the context of what Jesus was trying to share with the people gathered in that moment, then yeah, that can sound like that's exactly what that's supposed to mean. Jesus intends for us to unpack further 
if I read, I'm going to go back to my relationship with my husband. If I read verbatim his text messages to myself, there would be a lot of hurt, misunderstanding, misperception certainly of like what he intended me to see because it might be real blunt in some places and not so blunt in another. But then when I actually go deeper with him and call him on the phone and say, what did you mean when you said? We had an old boss that was like that. He would send emails. He'd be like, do this. And then we'd see him in the hallway and be like, did you guys get a chance to do that thing yet? And he was so nice. <laughs> he was so nice. Right? That wasn't, I thought yeah. that you totally meant this. What's the context? What's the true heart of it? And right. when you truly study scripture, you do get a window through uh, the means of people who understood the times, who understood the language of the times, who certainly was able to almost like sit you down in the middle of like a virtual reality experience of seeing, why did he always talk about farming? Uh Why was he always talking about? It's because that was what was available in the moment. Like if you can fathom Jesus sitting down in the middle of like New York City, what would he choose to use to relate Mm -hmm. to the people around him to speak about? So having said that, there have been people in my life who I love very, very much, who I think authentically love Jesus Christ, but they have thought things that I do not agree with when it comes to like, oh, well, if he had prayed hard enough, he wouldn't be dead now. Mm. Those kinds of things uttered in people's presence, especially if they've just lost a loved one and nobody prayed harder for them. Yeah, yeah. That is not- and hey, not okay. That is not what I perceive Jesus would ever tell anybody. That's the Christian misconception here. That because uh, you have maybe three or four more. Let's make it a part two. Let's, like let's do the lot. others next week, right? <laughs> this is going to be good because I think working through these misconceptions, whether it's Christians believe this misconception or people that have left the church or refused to be a part of the church, the collective church, yeah, uh, that that those misconceptions and so, these misconceptions they do exist for a reason. Mm -hmm. It's not just because, you know, you think about some of the questions that are gonna pop up here and you're like, oh, it's just because they're dumb. No, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's because there are thoughtful people around us that experience life just like us. And it doesn't make us better than them. We just may be privy to information they don't have yet. Yeah, yeah. And we can encourage them and hopefully fill in any of those holes and, and invite them to know not a religion, but a person that God loves us so much. I mean, yeah, it would be unfathomable unfathomable for a young Nabil Qureshi to think of it in that terms because he had been raised in a culture yeah. that told him this is what God looks like. Sure. This is who he is. And beautifully enough, he already so was invested in a supreme being because he saw evidence for it in science, which by the way, that's another misconception Ooh, that right. science and Christianity are a war misconception. He saw evidence for a beginning. He saw, you know, and he believed Yeah. and God just wanted to invite him further into the table and say, but you have misconceptions about the personhood of who I really am. Yeah. How have I revealed myself truly, right? This yeah. is my character. Uh, so, so many great misconceptions to get to next week. So let's, let's table that for discussion number two on this. Okay. But I do want to say in terms of the Christian misconception, we were just talking about that. Uh, if you just pray hard enough or whatever. Uh, and I think you just simply, hopefully a good place to go is go, then why did Jesus die on a cross? And I mean, like when he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane and says, is there another way? Mm. Why did Paul so clearly struggle with vision or pain or yeah. something that was going, a thorn, thorn in his in flesh, his right? Flesh. Um, and, and most scholars think that's literal physical, like, he, like, you know, and then obviously, you know, him being arrested multiple times anyway, much less physical ailment. Uh, why did John the Baptist, why was he beheaded? You start naming, why did all the apostles, well, about maybe half of them or so, uh, why they're martyred, right? And- I just think you can't sit here and tell me if you pray hard enough, then it'll come true. And then you have the opposite example of the apostles and Jesus himself praying and it not happening the way they wanted. Yeah. I don't think you can sit here scripturally and tell me that that statement is true. Well, Jesus really was clear with his disciples. If you pray in his name, if you're in his will, if you are aligned with who he is, Mm -hmm. That's the key. Not my will, but your will be done. Yep. And yep. that is in the whole mustard seed situation, it's the same thing. We kind of miss that part. It's like, if you're praying this in mind, if you are in the right place with me yep. and you know this is a thing that needs to happen, like there were people in Bible days like who just said, hey, 
it's not going to rain for so many years. And right. you're like, how does right. one do that as yeah. a prophet? With like, <laughs> did you confer with God on this? Uh-huh. But he yeah. was in alignment with God. And so that's what uh, Elijah did. And it didn't rain for a while, you know? My desires become God's desires. Uh, or excuse me. Yeah. Mine, mine become what mm-hmm. God's already were. Yeah. When I'm closer to him. And that means that more and more that I say and do. Yes will come to fruition in that way. I'll like Paul, I'm sure realized this is just the situation. This is I'm in jail and it's for a purpose. And And he had been saved so many times prior to when he was martyred Mm -hmm. with Mm -hmm. the snake. True. That's true. And like how many times did he like get beaten to death? And then I love the image real quick with Bruce Almighty and Jim Carrey and Morgan Freeman's like, hey, you think you can be God? And then just to get it all done, like requests, prayer requests come in like emails. And he just says, yes, reply all yes to everything. And we see the chaos of all of that. Yeah, You can't right. say yes to everything. God in his infinite wisdom operates and he is infinite wisdom. I don't. So yep. if I'm in alignment with infinite wisdom, thy will be done. Uh, we're going to be sitting pretty. That's great. Yeah. Even if it can be ugly around us, we're sitting with the one who knows how to get us through it. Part two next week, more misconceptions of Christianity and how to go about them next week on the Anything But Quiet Time podcast. Mm-hmm.